So uh, hello everybody, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight on this uh, what's a lovely sunny evening in Dumfries and Galloway. It's nice to see you all here. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna pass over in a minute uh, to Taff, who's gonna talk to us about a fascinating project. Uh, I'll just run through a couple of things with you. There's lots of people entering the waiting room, so I'm gonna keep going for another minute or two while we just let them in. Uh, so uh, tonight we're gonna hear about the Great War Huts project. Very interesting to anyone with an interest in the Devil's Porridge Museum and HM Factory Gretna, which is obviously the main focus of the museum. Uh, there were hundreds of huts at HM Factory Gretna, uh, and I first heard about uh, the Great War Huts project a couple of years ago. They've got very active Twitter presence and very good, uh, doing lots of good work down there in, uh, I want to say Suffolk, am I right? Yeah. Ipswich, Suffolk, yeah, there we go. I was going to say Sussex, but I, I stopped myself. So it's Suffolk, definitely. Uh, they're doing some great work, and I think it would be fantastic to hear about it. Um, so very pleased to have Taff here tonight to talk about that. We've got a lot of different events coming up. We've got um, wikithons, mini conferences mm -hmm. with the research project, and we've also got our continuing project program of online events. Uh, so we've got uh, the next one, which I think is fully booked, which is why I haven't put it on there, which is fur coats and overalls, but that will be available as a um, recording. Uh, and then we've got the lost men of the parish of one parish of Carlisle, which would be an interesting one. And then we have also got a look at firefighting in HM Factory Gretna. So we've got some really interesting things coming up. So if you want to book to come along to those, gives you the chance to hear it live and ask questions and participate. If you miss any of those, then they will be available as recordings via our YouTube channel. So just a little reminder, a couple of housekeeping things. You are all muted at the moment and you will remain muted until the end of Taft's talk. If you have any questions, comments or anything to say, please pop them in the chat, particularly if you're experiencing any technical problems that you'd like help with or if you can't hear or anything like that. Uh, the, this is being recorded. So if you have your camera on, there's a likelihood you might appear on screen. If you'd rather not appear on screen, then please just turn your camera off. Um, so keep a note of any questions or ideas. If you can pop them in the chat as we go, and we'll have a chance for questions at the end. It looks like people entering the, the, the session have sort of slowed <clears> down a little bit. So hopefully everyone's here who wants to be here, but I'll keep an eye on that as we go through. It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Taff Gillingham. Uh, from the Great War Huts project who's going to deliver for what I'm sure will be a fascinating talk if our little chat earlier is anything to go by. I think it'll be of great interest to people in the audience. So I'll hand over to you Taff. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's a it, well it's just nice to uh, to find a, a, a bunch of fellow hut enthusiasts uh, in other parts of the country. So um, what I'm going to do I'm going to uh, share my screen because uh, now you all know what I look like so I'm going to disappear and uh, and bring up the the slideshow. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about really for the next 40 or 50 minutes is Great War Huts which is as it says our ex accidental First World War heritage project. Um, so how on earth did this come about? Um, the, fr from the start, um, just a bit of background about us. We, we, I mean, I'm a military historian. I've been doing this sort of stuff for many years. But uh, back in 2001, Kev Smith and I set up a company called Khaki Devil Limited to provide uniforms, equipment, weapons, props, historical advice for film, television and theatre work. And our specialism really is historical accuracy and detail. So over the years, we've got to do all sorts of interesting things. And as part of that, We've built a, a, a trench system on the outskirts of Ipswich, uh, quite a big one where people like Downton Abbey or the recent Journey's End film, Blue Peter, um, many of the documentaries you'll have seen over the last sort of 15, 20 years, um, even things, uh, mad things like the British Bake Off, but they've all come to our bit of Suffolk to, uh, to film their First World War bits and pieces. And every time we'd done a high profile job, Every time it had been a Downton Abbey or a, or a major film or, or something that had struck a chord with people, we would be inundated with people saying, oh, can we ever come and look at your trenches? Can I bring the WI? Can I bring the school? Can I just come and have a look? And you couldn't because we don't have planning permission for public visits. Um, we, uh, we, we, it's not really safe for the public to wander around it. And much more importantly, what we've built as a film set 
so if you wanted to see a first war trench where it was filled with right angles to limit blast damage so if a shell lands in one bit the blast doesn't go around the corner and what we'd done we'd opened all those angles out to give better sight lines for cameras so if you came to see our trenches you wouldn't come to see a, a, a first world war trench you'd come to see a film set so it got us thinking that what we ought to do as clearly there was an interest in this was find somewhere where we could build a proper first world war visitors center and it took us nearly seven years to find somewhere but eventually we found a place called brook farm at horsted just south of bury st edmunds and after a, a lengthy fairly tortuous planning battle um which uh, which saw that the head of planning for st edmundsbury tell us that we wouldn't get planning and i quote in a million years but why don't you play the planning game you might get lucky um and actually we got some very good advice from a, from the JTS partnership down in Kent, uh, run by a fellow called Nick Pryor, who's uh, one of the guys who belongs to the Duran group, who go exploring the, the tunnels underneath the Western Front. And he came along and looked at it and said to us, look, as long as you cross all the T's, T's as long as you dot all the I's, as long as you do everything I tell you to do, it's not going to be cheap, but by the end of it, there won't be a reason why they can stop you from doing this. And, and that's pretty much exactly what happened. So. After several months of bats and badger surveys, traffic surveys, you name it, um, eventually it went to the planning committee and was passed unanimously. In fact, it was the only planning application that day that was passed unanimously. Um, and this was pretty crucial for us because at this stage, we bought the site without having the planning permission. Um, we wanted to demonstrate to the local people and to everybody else that first and foremost, we were committed. We wanted to be part of village life in Horsted. We didn't want to be squatters. And, and also it was very important that we owned our own site. What we didn't want to do is build somewhere. And then a few years down the road, the landowner turns up and says, right, you know, time to hop it. I'm going to sell all this for housing. So that was the reason that, that we bought it first and foremost. And, and that paid back because uh, that we, we, we were capable of showing that we were committed and, and got planning permission to build First World War trenches, to build a car park, uh, to adapt a lovely old Victorian barn. And there's also a big shed on the site as well, which we were able to, to, to use for our uniform and equipment hire business. So everything was contained in one place in a lovely little river valley uh, in, in Suffolk. It's lovely and peaceful. Um, and, um, and at the time we got planning permission to build 11 replica First World War Army huts. As you can see on the plan there, the, the, the gray rectangular blobs, uh, the largest one was going to be a recreation hut with a stage at one end where we could put on talks and have conferences, uh, exhibitions, um, and then other huts, display huts and a guard room and goodness knows what else. But within a couple of weeks of getting the planning permission, by complete fluke, we started finding original First World War Army huts. In fact, the very first one uh, was a hut that had belonged to Ipswich Labour Club. Um, the army had originally put it up in, in Colchester at Colchester Garrison in 1917. And actually, as you can see there, that's two separate barrack huts. It's two separate, probably mid to late war barrack huts that the army had joined together to make a recreation hut. And they put a stage in at one end. Um, as you can imagine at the time, it didn't have that hideous 1960s floor, but you get the general idea. So it's two huts with the central walls cut away. Uh, the roof had actually been raised slightly in the middle and those four lengths of gas pipe that ran down the center to hold the roof up. And uh, I went to see the secretary of the club and said, I understand that you've, got, you've, you've literally just got planning permission to pull this old hut down and build a new function room. Oh yeah, it's been a nightmare. It's taken us eight years to get rid of this damn thing. And, uh, and I said to him, so, um, so I bet it won't be cheap to pull it down either, will it? He said, oh no, we've been quoted 8,000 pounds to pull this damn thing down. And with hindsight, I should have said, well, we'll do it for seven. Needless to say at the time with all that inexperience, I said, well, how would you feel if we took it for free? If we just took it away for you? And he said, why on earth would you do that? And I explained what we were doing. And he said, well, I'll have to run it past the committee, but no one's going to object to that. And that's what we did in the, uh, in the summer, in the July and August of 2014, we dismantled it. We took it back to, to Horsted to our site and over the winter in freezing cold and very uncomfortable conditions, uh, my business partner Kev Smith and, and Harry Smith, the young lad who worked for us, uh, the two of them restored all of the panels uh, because this being a, a late war hut was made in, in sections, so it was all in six foot sections, including the roof. And then the following spring in 2015, the whole thing went back up again. 
Now this time obviously renewed the bits that, that needed cutting out. Uh, remarkably, most of the outside was in very good condition. Most of those, uh, those weatherboards that you can see there are the original ones from over a century ago. Most of the framing inside was original. All of those, uh, the, the roof trusses, they, uh, those are all original too. Uh, we, we were able to save quite a considerable amount of it. And I should say at this point that, that Kev, who, who's uh, in blue there, um, my business partner, Kev Smith was an aircraft engineer uh, back in the 1970s. He worked for Marshall's Aerospace um, and uh, he was member number 19 of Duxford Aviation Society in the days long before the Imperial War Museum got involved. So just shows how long he's been around. Um, but he's brilliant. I mean, it, it, there's nothing that he either can't make or, or see how someone else has made it and reverse engineer it. Uh, and he can make literally anything. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, this afternoon uh, for the uniform hire business, he's been making a, a pair of Chairman Mao hats for, for the new Spitting Image series. I mean, you just, you never know what you might get asked to do in this game, but, uh, but what he's doing most of the time is restoring First World War buildings. And obviously this was the this was the first one. Uh, we didn't know anything about First World War army huts at this stage. Uh, obviously having an interest in the First World War, uh, we knew that there were huts, but we, we'd never really taken much notice of them, like, pretty much like everybody else who has an interest in the First World War. And um, we'd always, for a start, we'd assumed that they were pretty much all the same. And we'd also thought there can't be many left uh, and uh, how wrong we were with that as well. Um, so we started doing a bit of digging. We started looking into uh, the, the history of the huts. And very quickly, we realized that uh, in 1914, when the war broke out, the British army could accommodate something like 140,000 British soldiers in brick barracks. So um, down in Suffolk, like, the, uh, like uh, what became Gibraltar barracks at Barry St. Edmunds, obviously Fort George up in uh, you know, the north of Scotland, all of these old Victorian, mostly 1880s brick barracks, built as depots at the time of the Cardwell reforms. And in 1914, in August 1914, Lord Kitchener asks for 100,000 volunteers and a million men turn up. There's not enough uniforms for them, there's not enough weapons for them, there's not enough food, there's not enough NCOs to train them, and the biggest problem of all is accommodation. So to begin with, many of them are in private houses, they're in, um, they're in factories, they're in town halls, um, they're in, under canvas, but it's a real problem because battalion commanders are, are trying to, first thing in the morning, you have to gather all these men together, you have to march them somewhere to feed them. Once you've done that, you need to march them somewhere else to then spend the day training and then reverse all that process in the evening to get them back into their private houses or billets or wherever they have to be staying. And so, Literally within the first few days of the war, Major Armstrong of the Royal Engineers was commissioned by the War Office to produce designs for 32 different buildings, which in any combination could produce a, a divisional army camp, a brigade camp, a battalion camp, a, an airfield, a rifle range, a cavalry barracks, you name it. Uh, everything from a tiny little gathering of, of three or four huts right up to a, a, a divisional camp with, with hundreds of them. And those drawings are all completed in next to no time. Uh, remarkably, a lot of them still exist. Um, we were very, very lucky. We discovered quite early on that uh, Hogs of Coney Weston, uh, very near to Bury St Edmunds, had handed their entire archive, uh, uh, well over 100 years of archive, to the Suffolk Record Office uh, about 10 years earlier. And um, in amongst them were, was all the original paperwork and uh, tender documents and all sorts of stuff, um, and, and all of the letters relating to uh, contracts that they'd had for building First World War army huts in 1914, 15, 16. Um, and amongst them was this complete set of drawings, uh, Armstrong's original drawings, um, for, 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 as you can see there, for, for a whole standing camp for a battalion of infantry at war strength. So it's everything. It's, uh, it, it's the recreation huts, the sergeant's mess huts, it's the, it, it's the, um, it, it's the, the little brick um, outhouse for the dung heap, uh, you name it, latrine block, barrack huts, drying rooms, everything that you could imagine, all the storerooms. And so we were literally able to, to copy everything that we needed uh, quite quickly. Um, and the, the sort of the basic, uh, the original form of, of, uh, of Armstrong's huts, uh, which I'll come on to later, there was all the original drawings for those too. Although the first one that we'd got actually wasn't one of those at all. But, but in amongst the, the paperwork were things like this. This is the original drawing for the architrave for the windows. Um, and again, when, uh, when Kev was, was putting the architrave back inside uh, that, the recreation hut, the big recreation hut, um, originally thought, well, we'll just go and buy some architrave. And then we found this and realized that actually, 
we can make the architrave exactly as it would have been, a flat button just with the edges sham chamfered off uh, and make it exactly how it was when uh, uh, on the 30th of December 1914 there, as you can see, when, uh, when, when that was issued. So all of that information still exists, which has been uh, incredibly useful, as you might imagine. Um, the next thing we discovered was just how different the huts were. Uh, Armstrong's design obviously had gone out uh, from the Department of Works to all these different contractors, but immediately there were other people coming back to them, other manufacturers saying, look, we, we already make temporary buildings, which we ship all over the world as mission huts, as, uh, as, uh, um, as accommodation for building projects. I mean, even uh, um, all of those Wild West buildings that, uh, that we see in all the old Wild West films, most of those buildings were built in this country and shipped out flat packed and then built in the in, in the middle of the wild west i mean that's a it was a, a very common thing to do so there were plenty of companies making essentially 60 foot by 20 foot buildings with windows in and doors at either end that could be adapted for, for military use so the, uh, the the war department simply looked at all of those rubber stamped all the ones which were suitable and you end up with all sorts of different varieties and variations i mean this one in the in the picture um this was a postcard that was in a Amongst my grandfather's papers, it's uh, St. Lucia Barracks in Borden. You can see here with uh, uh, with very fancy with chimneys that actually got uh, yeah, actually got fireplaces in these. Uh, but that's uh, that's actually the exception, as you can imagine, rather than the rule. Most barrack huts, the interior was just like this, uh, with four six foot tables, eight six, uh, six foot benches. Uh, it had a stove, which you can just see just the, the the base of it just peeking in there on the on the left hand side. The bed spaces themselves weren't beds at all. They were little low wooden trestles with three planks laying on them, six foot six by six foot wide planks, um, which obviously you'd sleep on at night. During the day, the planks would be stood at the side of the room or lined up along the, the side of the room with all of the, the trestles pushed back, which is what you can see in this photograph, to make plenty of room so the fellas could get around the table to eat their food, clean their kit uh, and just have room to, to live. Um, the, uh, very often the, the planks were then taken outside and aired. You often see photographs, there's some great photographs from places like Clipstone Camp with those planks laying up against the, the, the side of the building. So it, uh, you know, it, 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 th this, this is pretty much the format right across the board. Between all of the windows, you can just about see there, there's shelves uh, where two men would, would put their, like the mess tins and various bits and pieces. Underneath the shelves, there would normally be six hooks so again, three each for two fellas where they could hang their equipment and the great coat and the jackets uh, and everything else was then piled on the bed uh, when, it, when it was folded up during the day. Um, so that was the format for the standard hut and, and certainly one of the huts we will be rebuilding pretty much exactly like this. That's the intention that we'll put one back just as it would have been in 1915 that just looks like the fellas have gone off training for the day. Um, almost immediately that we we, we, we got some publicity for that first hut once uh, the local press, um, we told the local press that we were going to take the Ipswich Labour Club down and restore it. The phone started ringing. Um, <clears throat> oh, hello, we're Great Hawksley Women's Institute. We've got a hut that's a bit of a, a bit of a liability. Would you like to come and take it away? Oh, uh, we've got one that um, my mum's been living in and, um, you know, she would love you to have that. And I said, oh, that's great. Uh, shall I come this afternoon? Oh, no, it's mum's funeral today. Maybe you could come tomorrow. And it was like this. It, it, this went on and on. Uh, and this particular one up in Brockton in Staffordshire was a, a bungalow called Avondale. And it had been part of the big camp up at Brockton on Cannock Chase. There were two big camps on, on, on Brockton, uh, on Cannock Chase, uh, Brockton camp. And oh, blimey, can't remember the other one. Anyway, two huge camps up there. And after the war, this one had been sold, literally moved uh, just a half a mile down the road into the village and turned into a bungalow, which was a very, very common thing to do. In its original form, it would have been 60 foot long. And each of the sections, it, was, it would have been in 10 foot sections. And at either end, 10 foot at either end would have been turned in on both sides so that you had windows all the way round, and then they would then decide where they wanted to put the, the front door and the back door and inside was divided up into rooms. I mean this particular one had um, had a front room and a, and, and a, and a parlour and, uh, and a kitchen uh, and, a, and a bathroom uh, and it, interesting those the windows along the front there um, were, were, were the usual um, were, were the usual sort of standard um, hut window where the top half folds in but they've been adapted tipped on their sides so that they opened out like a normal casemate window so it um it's fascinating to see how all this sort of adaption was done post-war and it was a very popular thing to do because 65 pounds would buy you a 60 foot by 20 foot barrack hut which you could then turn into a house at, at, at relatively little cost and it was a very very cheap way uh, of providing accommodation after the war 
<clears throat> I, I put this one in really just to show the sort of process of dismantling. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the hut that belonged to the ladies of the Women's Institute at Great and Little Hawksley. Um, and um, that's the process, the whole thing being taken away in sections. Uh, and uh, just uh, and in, in the end, there was there was literally just an empty space with a with a low brick wall around it. And there was nothing else. We, we took the whole lot away. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of it has to be destroyed because it's not savable but the main framing and a lot of the timber out of, out of skin uh, a lot of the roof that that was certainly all, all savable and, and well worth saving as well because uh, we learned very quickly that um, that while some things are literally more hassle than they're worth um, it's really important for our, from our point of view that as much of the building is the original hundred year old timber as possible um, because if you just replace it with modern timber well you might as well just build a modern hut and, and really that's uh, that, that's not really what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> this one will be familiar to many of you with a with, with a, a, an interest in the Devil's Porridge Museum. This is Gretna Township or Timber Town as they called it and you can see the accommodation here for, for the workers. Um, again a different style of hut, uh, a bit bigger with, with much bigger windows, let a lot more light in uh, than, than many of the styles. Um, and the interesting thing here, in fact, uh, uh, Rini Anderson dropped me a line this week, uh, sent me an aerial photograph of the, the camp at Gretna uh, and was saying that she'd lived in one of these as a bungalow. And, um, and many of them had, um, had felt on the roof that was covered in tar, which as you can see here, very dark. Um, but also the, what, what was the sort of the senior, the off, what would have been the officer's accommodation in, you know, in normal terms. Uh, they all had concrete or asbestos uh, tiled roofs. Um, and what we've tended to do is we've gone down the route of putting the felt on, as you can see here. This this is the Brockton hut that was Avondale that uh, that, that you saw uh, be all sort of painted white a couple of slides ago. Um, but what we do, we we put the felt on the roof, but then we put corrugated tin over the top because probably a third of those at the time had corrugated iron on the rest of them were all felt. But of course, the problem with felt is that you're just forever having to repair it. And Rini was telling me that uh, it was very common that uh, in the 1950s they were still catching fire um, because as the repairs were done they would literally just pour tar onto the roof to make them waterproof and with all those open fires the sparks come out of the chimneys in the summer and just set light to the things in the, and um, it's very very difficult to put burning tar out once it's alight uh, as obviously many of those huts would have disappeared like that so so we don't do that we put the uh, we put the felt on and then we cover them in corrugated tin because that's uh, I mean ideally really sort of future proofing them and also most of the huts then have a similar look and the, the whole camp sort of blends in. Um, a lot of huts over the years have been adapted, they've been altered, many of them which are village halls have the windows replaced um, and that can be a real problem because when you put double glazing into a building that was designed to have an airflow it just makes it very damp and it holds the damp between the walls. Um, the other problem if there's any of you out there that are involved with organisations or village halls which have huts, at the bottom it's really really important that there's an airflow that can get underneath them because likewise um, most of these buildings will rot from the bottom up if there isn't an air gap underneath them. Um, over the years there have been all sorts of ways that people have tried to, to limit that problem. Uh, this one, this was a, a little bungalow called Hillside at, um, at Friston near Alborough and it had been a, an officer's accommodation hut originally at the Royal Naval Air Service aerodrome at Alborough and in 1921 it had been brought up to Friston on handcarts and reassembled as a bungalow and at some point in the 1980s the outside had been covered in chicken wire and then covered in concrete render which gives the impression of preserving it and uh, and making it look a bit better but needless to say what that had done it had rotted the framing on the inside so we had to cut all this concrete away in order to get to the timber frame to unbolt it and take it down and move it um, this is it with its outer skin off you can see there um, all of those sections bolted together and um, the, the the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service had slightly different patterns of, of huts to, uh, to to the army and so those windows are very distinctive uh, Royal Air Force and Royal Naval Air Service pattern uh, of which we were only able to save two uh, and because of that we decided that what we would do is make this hut into our guardroom hut so um, when we restored it we added the veranda, which was in Armstrong's original drawings, and turned it into the, the camp guardroom. And um, the, the left hand end, which is just the single room, um, that would have been the orderly room where the camp, I mean, it's only a little camp, so the camp's paperwork would have been done. Um, and what we're going to do, that will be the place where we tell the story of the original hut building project, because that, that, that hut building project in 1914-15 
which saw the, 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 the British army build enough accommodation, wooden hutted accommodation for 800,000 soldiers in a matter of months remains the largest building project in British history. There's nothing that comes close to it before or since. Uh, no one's ever really told that story before, so, so we're going to tell that story here. Um, and the other half of the room will tell the story of the 11 huts that we will end up restoring once we've got them all. Um, because to be honest, very often the social history of the hundred odd years after the war is every bit as interesting and in some cases more interesting than the story of the huts during the war itself. So that's a very important thing. Um, the other half of the, or two thirds of the guardroom are being restored exactly as a guardroom would have looked at the time. Um, and we're very, very keen to try and make it look as it would have done at the time and not overdo it. There's a, a temptation with heritage sites to, to almost uh, dress these places in the way that a, uh, a, a production designer or an art director would on a film so it'll be suddenly filled with random leather suitcases and all sorts of things that it wouldn't have in it but what we're trying to do is only put things back in that it would have had at the time so in, in, in there you obviously you can see the stove the safe in the corner is the safe that came from the guard room of the king's royal rifle corps at winchester um, and, and, and we've got the full list of what a, a small guard room in a camp like this would have had. We know how many brooms there would have been. We know how many coal shovels. Uh, we know how many coal scuttles. We know that because it was only a small camp, it would have had a stretcher and a pair of stretcher straps because there was no hospital. So all of that will go back into the guard room and, and most of that we've already got. So, so we're, we're making progress. Along the way, we find a lot of what we call hut archeology. span um, so this is a good example. This uh, this was from the, the Women's Institute huts, uh, the, the uh, Hawksley one. And you can still see there the building number A1 still still underneath all those layers of paint over a century later. Um, we recently found um, on, on a pair of internal doors uh, on another hut, um, very clearly you could see that it had been the officer's mess hut of the 11th Battalion Suffolk Regiment. So again, that's been saved. And later, it had been changed when 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 the camp became a hospital. Um, it had become the um, it became the mess for the for the hospital orderlies. So so all of that history we're, we're recording and we're saving as much of that as we can. Um, there was a hut that we couldn't save um, up near Wisbeach. It was in a terrible state, and uh, we had to say to the lady, "I'm terribly sorry. The roof has gone, the walls have gone, the floor's dangerous. Um, really, there's uh, there's a couple of spare doors laying inside it, which we'd very much like if we part with them, which she did." Um, and she said, no, no, I quite understand it's beyond help. And she said, uh, what did you think of my drawings? I said, what drawings? Oh, the drawings on the wall. So back into this death trap we go. And, um, and sure enough, um, many of these early huts were actually lined with asbestos sheet. And uh, very quickly it's replaced with timber because asbestos is very heavy, it's very brittle, it's not easy to transport. And so, uh, but this, this still had some of these surviving asbestos sheets inside it. And, one of them had got a whole load of names and addresses written on. The only other one still in there had got a whole load of these little cartoons of soldiers. So needless to say, uh, several weeks later, suited and booted with all the proper gear, we come back, take it out, and, and this will be um, mounted in our in, in the orderly room in the museum pit, uh, properly encased in, uh, you know, very securely uh, inside behind glass so that it's quite safe. Uh, but it's it's an important part of the story that many of them were lined with with asbestos, and obviously it's it's too lovely to uh, to leave it with uh, with these little drawings, um, just done by a soldier scribbling at the side of his bed well over a century ago. Um, as part of the project, we also collect hut ephemera, hut books. There's an awful lot of books that relate to, to, to the huts. A lot of that from the Church Army, the YMCA, the Salvation Army. Uh, there's um, little China huts there. You can see Goss China and others made, uh, made China huts. There were a lot of flag days. Uh, so all sorts of uh, interesting hut related badges, buttons, uh, goodness knows what else. And we literally find those all over the world. People ring me up or email and say, look, I've, I've just found this. Are you interested? Um, and, uh, and we gather anything at all that's hut related um, uh, to, to add to that archive and display. <clears throat> the huts themselves. Um, as I say, because the, the huts came in different types, so the constructions were in different types. This particular hut uh, in, in 1917, the, the women here making the huts, uh, I think this was Rouen, and the, the huts that were made in sections, so in this case in probably in six foot sections, um, they were made on a wooden jig, so all of them were exactly the same size, so when you came to put them up they'd bolt together and they knew that all of the parts would fit, and that's exactly 
how Kev does the same job now. So if we've got a hut that's made in sections, then he will make a jig. I mean, this particular one, I think this was the Brockton hut. So it's made for a, for a 10 foot section, a big heavy 10 foot section. And you can see there the, uh, where he's cut a piece out right in the foreground, the, the bottom right foreground. Um, and this one, you, you could actually see there uh, WP and S, the bit of timber at the front that he's had to cut out because it was rotten, but, uh, but that was the company that made it. So we're able to record all these uh, all these details as we're taking the buildings apart and, and restoring them again and wherever possible uh, we're preserving that in place inside either uh, encapsulate or sometimes it, they'll be uh, they'll be painted over with, um, with with lacquer or whatever just to preserve them as best we can um, but uh, but as I say it, it, wherever possible these are being restored exactly as they were at the time uh, in in some cases where it's been obvious that there was a design flaw which was causing them to, to rot away um, Ke Kev will have found a, a fix for that and he will be curing it to, to make sure that that we don't have exactly the same problems in years to come the workshop is always a busy place obviously you can see there Kev's putting uh, putting putting glass into windows but uh, but all sorts because it's not just the huts in between doing the huts themselves there's exhibits and artifacts that we're working on in the last few weeks uh, Kev's been he's just finished restoring a two inch trench howitzer um, which which was the toffee apple mortar that fired the big toffee apple bombs uh, during the first world war um, he's restored a, a, a post box that, that came from great finborough post office which was the, the first world war period the 1910 i think it was fitted there uh, so uh, so things like that um, a First World War aerial bomb. He's just finished restoring that. So, so there's all sorts of stuff that uh, that goes on in the workshop in addition to the huts because um, the way that the project works, we're, we raise a bit of money, we do some hut work, and then suddenly we'll run out of money. It goes a bit quiet, and but then there'll be other things. So, go, I know, I'll. Well, well, I've got nothing else to do. I've got enough materials. I'll, I'll repair this or I'll fix that. Um, there's a Lewis gun cart that he's on the case with at the moment. So uh, it, it's never a dull moment and you never quite know what he's doing. In fact, actually today, um, actually not today, today he would have been uh, working on a, a sentry box for the outside of the camp. Um, we've literally just found a, a, a cracking picture of a, of, a, of a corrugated tin flat roofed sentry box from Codford camp. So he's gonna make a, a copy of one of those. So we've got one of those outside the gate. So uh, yeah, quite, uh, quite extraordinary. All of the time there's something going on even when we can't get on with doing huts. Um, this is one of my favourites. Uh, we had a call from Girton Women's Institute near Cambridge. Uh, they'd moved out of their, their hut and uh, got new accommodation. At the time, Kev was busy with another one and he said, well, I'm not sure, you know, we're, we, 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 we're a bit stacked out at the minute. I don't think we can cope with another one. So I went and had a look on my own and got there and I, I had a good old look at it and thought, well, it's, it's interesting. It's clearly got its original corrugated tin, which was, you know, was scabby at the bottom. So it really wasn't going to be worth keeping, but it was clear that underneath it, the framing itself was in very, very good order. So uh, I did manage to persuade him to to um, to, uh, to 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 come over and have a look. And he said, "Yes, actually, we do need to save this." And what we start doing, we start putting photographs on our Facebook page showing the work that we're doing. And as we were stripping out the inside of one end, I had a, a message one afternoon when I was at work from a, an American lady who was an architecture student at Cambridge University, a lady called Carrie Draper, and her PhD was on temporary British wooden buildings of the two world wars. And why wouldn't it be? Anyway, she said, my goodness, that's an Armstrong hut, isn't it? And I looked at the photographs that we'd been putting up and we hadn't noticed, but actually it was exactly the same as Armstrong's drawings. When you compared it, it was absolutely identical. It was a huge four four inch square timbers. Everything about it was exactly the same. I mean, that it had a window put in the end with, instead of the door, but it but it was an Armstrong hut. And I had a bit of a chat with her, and clearly it had got its original corrugated tin on, which had still got the uh, the markings on it, so we knew it was exactly it, it, that it was what it was. And um, and then uh, th then I drove home, and when I got home, I thought there's something really odd about this because the Women's Institute at Girton had bought it from Cherry, Cherry Hinton Military Hospital, as you can see on the map there. Now, Cherry Hinton Hospital was an army VD hospital because to be honest, halfway through the war, there was a much bigger need for VD hospitals in a lot of cases than there was for gunshot wounds. In fact, we've, we've got a, at least one other, which had been a VD ward from a different hospital. Um, and the, the people of Cherry Hinton at the end of the war, um, Cambridge City Council had said, look, there's a ready built housing estate. It's got water laid on, it's got electricity, it's a, it's a little community. And the locals said, no, we know what it's been used for, you can take it away. So they had to sell it off. And 
the Women's Institute at Girton bought a hut. It was taken back to, to Girton, reassembled. We know that it went back up in November 1920 because the husband of the first chairman of the WI had, had signed his name on it and put the date when he put it back up. So we know exactly when it was when it was put back up. And so I'm sitting there. I, I haven't even got out of the car at this point. I've just driven home. and I think, well, this doesn't make any sense, because if it's as early as as we know it is by, by the corrugated tin, and we know that that's early because by the end of 1914, they were already taking they, they were already stopping putting tin on the huts and replacing it with wood because the, the metal was going to be needed for the war effort. Um, so if it's that early, it doesn't make any sense that it's for an army VD hospital because the need in September, October 1914 was for accommodation not for VD hospitals. And then just a uh, just sudden leap of, of brain. I mean, my great passion is, is the Suffolk Regiment. That's a great interest of mine. But uh, Lindsay, my partner and I had been on a, a battlefield tour with a fellow called Phil Kerm um, in 2017, in April 2017. And Phil's expertise was on the 11th Service Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment. Now, the 11th Service Battalion were all the men from Cambridgeshire. And uh, and in his sort of preamble, when we were in France, before we sort of got to the main nitty gritty of the, of, of the battle sites, he was talking about how the battalion was raised, which was all familiar to me, and how when they were first raised, um, there wasn't anywhere to put them. So half of them were in a school in, in, on one side of Cambridge, half of them were in another school on the other side. And the battalion commander said, look, this is ridiculous. I can't train men when I've got to spend half a day gathering them all together. And so he wrote to the war office and said, I would love to have a camp just for my battalion. And very unusually, the war office agreed. And so William Sindels built a camp at Cherry Hinton specifically for the 11th Service Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment. And when I then looked that up, I realised that that camp for the 11th Suffolks then became the camp, well, the hospital at Cherry Hinton, the VD hospital. So what we'd got was one of the original huts for the 11th Service Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment, which A, I was really pleased about because I've got, got a great interest in the Suffolk Regiment, but secondly, because it's very, very rare. In fact, I can't think of another single example where you could say, we know who was in this. You might be able to say, well, it's a brigade camp, so it could be one of four or whatever, but, but in terms of surviving examples, to actually put your finger on it and say, we know who was in this hut is very, very rare. So, I then ring up Kevin. I said, "You know, we're going to build that barrack up. We're going to do a barrack up with all in, you know, with it, with everything in it. It should have the beds and everything." I said, and "You know, we're going to have to use a, a 16 foot wide hut, one of the later war huts, because there isn't much room. Because basically, on the site, there's a field, there's a drop, there's not much room. We've then got to have a road that's 12 and a half feet wide to get emergency vehicles past. There's then going to be a row of huts at 90 degrees, which are which back onto the river." Then there's the river, so it's fine up. There's not much space. And he said, oh yes, yeah, it's got to be a 16 foot hut because there isn't the space. And I said, look, I'm afraid we're going to have to put this 20 foot girton out there. He said, well, we can't, there isn't the space. I said, let me just tell you what it is. So I explained to him what it was. I said, look, it's it's an 11th Suffolk's hut. It, it came from Cherry Hinton camp. It's it's one of the reasons we know who was in it. And um, and and he, he was coming up with all sorts of reasons why that wouldn't be possible. And then I said, um, where were you born? And there was a moment's silence before he went, yeah, 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 Cherry Hinton. I said, OK. And, uh, and you had two uncles who served in the Suffolk Regiment. And, and what battalion was that again? And a few seconds of silence before, yeah, the 11th Service Battalion. I said, so there is literally a one in 30 chance that your relatives slept and lived in this hut. And by the time I got into the work the following morning, Kevin Harry were already digging four feet out of the bank to make the, uh, enough space to put the hut up. And needless to say, that's now the hut that's, uh, that's going up. There it is. Now, these early huts were not built in sections. These huts were built using individual timbers. They were built as a solid frame. And once the frame was put up, they were then clad in corrugated tin like this. Um, and Normally you see them, that they've also got paint on the outside. I mean, the Royal Flying Corps, all theirs were green. Uh, a lot of the army ones se seem to have been black, but we're going to leave this one unpainted because amongst various archives, we've got photographs of the officers and the men of the 11th Service Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment. Uh, this is, uh, I think, made, uh, well, Lieutenant Brett as he was at the time, later Major Brett, um, with a couple of his chums outside what is clearly an unpainted corrugated tin hut at Cherry Hinton Camp. So we're, we're going to preserve that pretty much as, exactly as it was at the time. And what we're going to do inside it, um, 
each of those 32 bed spaces and the NCO's room at the end uh, will be identifiable in some form or other as bed spaces of, of men who served with the 11th Battalion throughout the war uh, with all sorts of different experience. Some who were men who joined right from the start, who were then discharged because they weren't fit enough, men who went off to other battalions, uh, some who were killed on the first day of the Somme or badly wounded because they had a terrible battering there. Uh, likewise, the, the attack at Rue Chemical Works in, during the Battle of Arras in 1917, and then of course the, the March and April offensives which, which clobbered the 11th Battalion twice. And also a big chunk of them who were survivors who came home at the end of the war, including those who were still getting on battlefield tours in the late 1980s and 90s who we met. So that whole experience of the battalion at war will be in that room. That's the intention. And of course, it's it might well be the story of the 11th Battalion, but you could pretty much relate that to, to virtually every other infantry battalion. They, they will all have had a, a similar story. Um, at this point, I'd like to just mention volunteers. I don't think any project like this could could do what we do without the help of enthusiastic volunteers. Uh, we have regulars who come week in, week out, uh, doing all sorts of stuff. Some uh, very, very skilled, some with no skills at all and just uh, bags and bags of enthusiasm. Uh, but every year we have at least two volunteer weekends where everybody crashes in, gets as much stuff done as possible because it's not just the the hut building and the painting of uh, of creosote and goodness knows what there's also the site to manage the river needs clearing the weeds need sorting out the you know overhanging trees need need dealing with all of that stuff enthusiastically done by volunteers and uh, and, and they do a brilliant job uh, and in fact some of them do great jobs fundraising for us there's uh, marion there who uh, she puts on um uh, bingo events uh, up at Wisbeach where she lives uh, which she would be putting on uh, anyway because uh, all of her friends love uh, an afternoon doing bingo um, but for the last few years she's been doing at least one of those a year to raise money for us and every time it's it's anything between 800 and a thousand pounds which for a project like this will push us on a huge distance it really will I mean that will will virtually pay for for all the corrugated tin for the roof of one of the huts um, or it might well pay for it will certainly pay for for all of the the the, uh, the, the, the wood preservative or whatever we need to, to coat two or three of them so this sort of stuff makes a massive difference but to be honest every five pound note that we get given uh, that's a lot of nails uh, which we can buy which will keep the fellas going for several days um, and we get through an awful lot of nails as you might imagine um, the main recreation hut uh, in recent times we've done all sorts we've had uh, we've had plays we've staged there the uh, mesh theatre company many of you will come across mesh they did a, a brilliant version of journey's end that we supplied all the uniforms for over in belgium um, they also did a production called the soldier about uh, rupert brook which which we we hosted in the um, in the recreation hut uh, we, we've put on all sorts of talks and events and goodness knows what else and one of the most successful uh, was a, an art exhibition uh, of, of tim tim godden's work uh, he's, he's very popular cartoons uh, that uh, that many of you uh, would have seen on social media and some of you I'm sure own. In fact, I know some of you do because I saw some of you uh, as, as you were checking in earlier. Um, but it just shows what a versatile space this is. Um, you can see there how we uh, how we decided that we were going to hang them on these boards, really just to open the space up and keep the keep it looking light and bright. Um, in September, uh, for Heritage Open Days, we're, we're going to be open every day from the Friday the 10th right the way through to Sunday the 19th. And our exhibition this year is going to be called Draws for Wars. So looking at British military underwear uh, pretty much from the First World War right the way through to the present day. And we've got some quite extraordinary examples uh, which will be on display. So, um, so that's, uh, that, that's something that we're working on at the moment. Um, our outreach project called Love Your Hut, where we, we give advice and help to anybody who's got a hut, um, village halls, scout groups. Um, sometimes we'll go and, and, and really just say, look, there's, sadly, there is nothing you can do with this. It's, it is time that you had another building. But other times, I mean, most recently, South Luffenham Village Hall in, in Rutland, um, they, they came to us and said, look, there, there are plenty of people in the village who say that this should be pulled down. It's, it's past its best. What do you think? And we said, well, there's, there's, there's literally nothing wrong with it. It needs a bit of love and care and attention. Uh, look at these bits. Uh, and also you might consider pulling all this hideous sort of uh, modern panelling off because underneath it's going to look, uh, it'll be a great looking building, which they've done. They've, they've, they've turned it into a fantastic looking um, village space um, and they love it. And it's now become back uh, the, the sort of the centre of village life. 
life again. So, um, but we've also helped um, English Heritage National Trust, um, uh, that Bally Kindler, uh, we helped them. They've uh, literally just made a replica Armstrong hut, uh, which they've almost finished over in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, archaeology projects, uh, people who are researching uh, the site of former army camps, uh, we're able to look at the paperwork and they'll show us sort of a concrete footings and we can go, oh yeah, that's that's clear, that was a drying room or that was a toilet block or something like that. So all sorts of people we're able to help with the information that we've got and obviously we gather as much information we can about surviving examples as well. Um, this is the sort of uh, the, the plan of how the, the hut part of the site will eventually look. Um, you can see on the right hand end there that the big building, that's our main building where we keep the uniforms and equipment. Uh, the next uh, is the original Victorian barn, which is, as you can see there, is going to have a, a cafe on the back and some toilets. The shop will be inside the barn and that will be that will be the main entrance. You'll come in through the end of the barn into the sort of little parade ground area. Um, the um, the, uh, this building here was there originally on site, it was an original Victorian cow buyer, but it sat in the middle of this area with the door facing the barn and uh, a local uh, crazy owner of a, of a JCB said I've got some really long forks, if you, if you put a concrete slab down I reckon I can lift that up and turn that and put that down again and he literally lifted it eight feet in the air and turned it around and, and plonked it back on the slab again so, so we were able to save that which is now our, our store. Uh, the building next to it is the guard room with the veranda the corrugated tin shed is the, the big barrack up that you've seen. Um, this hut we've just put up and actually it's longer than that. It's, uh, we've managed to save all 72 feet of that. Uh, the front part of it is gonna be changing exhibition space, uh, about 30 feet of changing exhibition space. The rest of it is going to become Kev's workshop. He's gonna move out of the current hut and move into that. Uh, the, the big double hut at the end there, that's, uh, that is the, the recreation hut with the stage at one end. And then, the six huts on this side, which are four 40 foot huts and two 30s because the, the river tapers in, um, that's where we're gonna tell the, the sort of chronological story of the war, but it's not gonna be, and then there was another battle, and then there was another battle, oh, and then there was another battle. It's, it's much more gonna be driven by artifacts. It's gonna be driven by interesting, um, interesting bits and pieces, interesting stories. And, and really it's about challenging the sort of the conventional narratives, it's about, making the First World War more interesting, making it more relatable and uh, and, and hopefully um, making more people take an interest in it into the future. Um, and education wise, the level that we're aiming this at, uh, school pupils will be very welcome, we, we already have school visits, but the level that the whole thing is pitched at is pretty much uh, at the level of most of you because you are all the type of people that go to museums, you tell other people about the museums you visited, you come back again and, and really you're the ones who are, who are sucking up all the knowledge, you're the ones who are interested who want to know, so that's the, the level that this is all going to be pitched at. Uh, the final hut down here in the, in the left hand corner, um, that's the, um, uh, for, for every 60 foot by 20 foot barrack up, for every, for every 16 of those there was one 28 foot by 80 foot which was either an officer's mess hut or it was a recreation hut uh, but they're a really big beast and we're hoping to get one of those which we shall shorten into into a, a 40 foot length and that will be the place where we tell the story of trench warfare of tunneling and more importantly we're going to build a, a small film theatre in there um, because when you come to, to walk through the trenches which we've already started to build um, the problem with anybody that's put in uh, sort of recreated trenches. It doesn't matter how good the trenches are, but when you walk through them, the one thing that none of us can do every day is fill it full of soldiers. But we run a company that hires uniforms and equipment and weapons and, 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 and props. So what we can do, we can fill it full of all the soldiers that it would have had in it, all the gear, everything. And we can then film a walkthrough so that when you sit in the film theatre you literally follow that through and then afterwards when you walk through the trench you go oh well this is where they were sleeping this is where they're eating this is where they were going to the loo this is where they were firing the trench mortar so it can give you a proper visual representation of it before you then go down into the into the trenches themselves um we've got plenty of stuff to, to to use as exhibits i mean literally kev and i have been collecting this stuff since we were kids uh, this is just a tiny, tiny fragment of Kev's collection of ordnance, and uh, but between us, um, we're, we're not going to struggle to fill it. Put it that way. It's uh, the problem already is deciding what we'll be leaving out when we come to do it. Um, 
So how have we been getting on over the last 18 months? I mean, in a way, we're quite lucky because we're still at the build phase. So we're, if, if it was open all the time and we've got a load of staff to pay, it might well have been a problem. But we were able to pretty much just mothball it last March when it, when it all kicked off. And then gradually, as things started to ease off a bit, um, we were able to get on and start doing some bits and pieces. So um, Lindsay um, decided that it was time that the, that the camp had its proper uh, Camp sign at the gate, so so, so that our neighbours didn't keep receiving boxes of uh, of rifles and goodness knows what else up the road. So that was a major step in the right direction. The main khaki devil building, where all the uniforms and equipment were stored, uh, was a right mess. I mean, it was breeze block, it was bright yellow, it was it was a horrible, horrible um, eyesore, really. So, for the, during the duration of the of lockdown, the first thing that we did was to batten it and completely cover it in wooden boards really so that it blended in with all of the rest of the huts and you can see there the windows uh, most of the windows actually look exactly like the uh, the hut windows which was just fluke really um but um but by the time it was done it now it looks much smarter obviously it, it blends into the landscape and and when you drive in it looks like it's it's part of the site and it's meant to be there um Likewise, at the same time, Kev built a, a, a sort of a temporary toilet block uh, big enough for, for decent sized parties of school pupils uh, because we've already started school visits because obviously at the moment they can't go to France or, or even if they can, most of them aren't risking the fact that they might get stuck there. Um, so we've already started having school visits because you know, we, we, we have period first wall buildings, we have all the gear, we've got the knowledge, of, we've been doing talks for school kids for years, um, and, and obviously we've got trenches as well, so we can offer them pretty much the, the, the experience that they would get if they went to France, just without the going to France, which obviously is a disappointment, but it's still better than the alternative, which is not going at all. Um, we also managed to get another hut up during the whole lockdown period uh, the what was the stow market guide hut um which was a i think it was a late war hut um the intention originally was that we got the concrete slab ready and last april uh, over the space of a weekend we were going to put the whole thing up literally in the space of a weekend so start on the friday with, a, with an empty slab sunday night have a complete hut all the volunteers just put it all up needless to say the first lockdown wiped that out by the time we got to October, it was looking like that might be possible to do the same thing in October. But again, another lockdown in October meant that we couldn't do it then. And Kev said, you know what, actually, we've got some volunteers who are, you know, who, who we can, we can, we don't need many, but we can do this distance. It's just going to take longer. So over the space of several weeks, they managed to, to bolt the whole thing together. And you can see there that how those late wall huts, not only are the walls in six foot sections, but also the roof are in six foot panels as well. And the whole thing just bolts together. Uh, until uh, that, that was it uh, with the, the felts gone on the roof. Since then, it's now got the corrugated tin and it's also got a, a, an original roof ventilator on it as well and, uh, and the double door on the end. And as I say, this will be Kev's workshop where, uh, I mean, we've even got a, um, a German 77 millimeter field gun, which was a, a war trophy, which he's, he's halfway through restoring. So we're looking forward to getting that in there and, and getting that underway again. Um, and that brings us really bang up to date. Um, the only other addition really, I mean, the, the, the surface area in there, we've just had a layer put on that. And, and in the next few weeks, it's gonna have uh, a, a proper surface put all, all over that. So really about halfway up the, the uh, up that uh, corrugated tin hut, it's all gonna be a proper surface. So it'll be a bit like a parade ground, which will at least give it a, a decent finish. Um, and the other major innovation really was that flagpole, which came from the first Ipswich Boys Brigade when they packed up uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and they um, they said to us, look, we're, we're having to give up. We it's, it's not that we haven't got the kids, but we, we haven't got enough instructors, so we're going to have to stop. And they gave us all sorts of interesting stuff and tucked in their store. I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's our flagpole. I said, well, it's not a very long flagpole, is it? Oh, well, Fred cut it into three pieces to fit it in the store. So I said, um, can we have it? And uh, he said, oh, well, well, we're thinking about restoring. I said, but you're not going to, are you? Because you're packing up. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, of course you can. So, so I, I, I bring these three bits of flagpole back to Kevin and say, can you fix that? And needless to say, he went, oh, yeah, I'll do that in the way that they used to repair a ship's masts and, and, and spliced it all back together again. And literally in the last week, um, the 21 foot original 1909 flagpole has gone up. Um, that the, the, I've flown that flag off it today, really, just to show you it with a flag flying, but it will have a, a slightly smaller, um, slightly better um, period looking Union flag off it. Um, but every uh, every camp would have had a, a flagpole 
Uh, it would also have had another flagpole at, at the gate, uh, which was a sort of a T-bar, which flew a, a Union flag off one side and the other side a flag to tell you whether it was a, an infantry camp, a, a depot, whether it was a petrol store, an ammunition dump, uh, a hospital. Uh, so that sort of thing, so that vehicles driving past would recognise it and know uh, that they were they were arriving at a hospital or army camp. So at some point we'll get that put up as well. Uh, but that, to be honest, is us now bang up to date. Uh, and and that's uh, that's it. That's as far as we are. Uh, so I think I shall stop sharing and uh, hand back to Judith if any of you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure I'll speak Thank for you. everyone. So that was fascinating. The questions have been coming in already, uh, Taf, so I'll, uh, I'll make a start on those. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, First World War military underwear exhibition. <laughs> Uh, so uh, somebody has asked, um, I assume there was no integral plumbing in the huts. Uh, what did those later convert into houses do? Well, yeah, you're right. In, in their original form, obviously, so, some which were then used as hospitals and toilet blocks and latrines and shower blocks, they would have had rudimentary plumbing and it was rudimentary. It was only cold water. Um, but after the war, the ones that we've taken down have literally just picked up uh, pipes from the mains, old leather, uh, old leather, old lead pipes into the buildings. Um, in fact, one of them had still got a, an old Ascot boiler over the sink and over the bath. So, uh, um, but I think Hillside, which was at Friston, the old lady had been living in that, and um, and that that had had a, a, a proper bathroom fitted in the 1980s, and a, and, uh, and no, a bathroom in the 60s and a kitchen in the 80s. So, so at that point, it, it had had what we would, you know, you'd almost consider to be modern plumbing put in, um, just underneath the floor and, and 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 cut through the floor underneath. So, so. I mean, that's the great thing with them. They are completely adaptable. They, they, they were perfect for post-war housing because you could adapt them and, and, and turn them into whatever you want and divide them up into to whatever space you needed. Yeah, I thought what you said about the idea that actually the story of them after the First World War is almost as interesting as the social history of what they've been used as and how they've been converted. It's uh, really interesting. I mean, I we, took, we, we took one down from Tring, which had been um, originally it was built by the London Territorial Gunners. They'd had a terrible first first winter of the war under canvas in appalling conditions in Gaybridge Park in uh, Hemel Hempstead. And in the spring of 1915, they'd built their own. They said, right, we're not putting up with this anymore. And they'd built their own 120 foot long huts. And after the war, um, a mill owner in Tring had bought one of them, shipped it back to Tring and, and had it rebuilt as a, as a church and a church hall combined. And, um, and as we were taking it down, it, it, over the years it ceased to be a church. It had become the um, New Mill Community Centre. And, and it was hugely popular and very controversial that the, that the church were, were having it pulled down to build houses on the site. But every five minutes, somebody would turn up at the door where we're trying to pull it down and go, oh, you know, I had my christening party here. Oh, well, when I got married, this is where we had the reception. And, and you realise just how much these buildings mean to the local communities and the people who lived in lived and worked nearby. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they, they really do. They hold all that history. It's it's been fascinating. Yeah, we were talking earlier about the HM Factory Gretna huts and how I know of two uh, that are rumoured to have been from HM Factory Gretna. Uh, one supposed to be a Baptist uh, church's um, community centre at Portobello in Edinburgh, and the other one is rumoured to be uh, a community centre in Brampton that used to be the gym. So, but the legacy of that and where they ended up is fascinating. Uh, so, there's a couple more questions for you. Um, what were the huts like to live in, temperature-wise, given most didn't have fires in them and had a metal skin? Um, when they were when they were new, when they were used by the army in the winter, they could be freezing cold. Um, the, uh, they were lined with, with wood, although the ones that were shipped out to hotter climates, places like Salonica, they didn't bother lining them because there was no need. Um, but I mean, I mean that, that 11th Suffolk hut at Girton, um, that didn't have vents in either end. Most of the huts, if you look at the pictures, have got a vent in either end at the top, but the early ones didn't. And that was a real problem because soldiers would come back from training, coughing and sneezing, they'd, they'd all go down with illness. And so the medical officer of the 11th Suffolk had all the boards knocked out at the top to get fresh air in. And it was winter. It was you know, this was January, February 1915. And in his in his diary, he says, you know, and every day I'd walk in the hut and the fellows have just stuffed all their greatcoats in the gap to try and keep the air in, you know, keep the heat in. Uh, so that they were cold. 
um, th th there was one stove which was normally either uh, it was it was in the middle of the hut but normally against one wall um, and you know it didn't throw out much heat at all it just sort of took the edge off uh, so most fellas would be sleeping underneath the great coats um, in fact even well into the 1950s national servicemen up on the you know up on the, the Yorkshire moors just described these uh, very primitive already derelict first world war huts with broken windows and uh, the wind just howling through them and how freezing cold they were uh yeah someone's uh, commented on uh, growing up in one of the houses in gretna my dad put solid fuel central heating in so it was warm before that i remember it being quite chilly in the mornings and yeah. uh, we've got descriptions of the female munition from one of the female munitions workers who lived in the huts at gretna and they remembered um their washing basin with frozen ice in it so <laughs> yeah. obviously it was quite cold I think that was one of the reasons that they rebuilt the majority of Gretna and East Riggs with um, stone buildings or with brick buildings instead. Um, so another question for you is, uh, when will the whole project be fully completed? <laughs> Good question. When we started this, um, we thought that we had to have everything done and finished before we could open the door. But yeah. Richard Van Emden, the, uh, the historian author, Richard's written a lot of books. R Richard set himself a target in the 1980s of interviewing 250 First World veterans before they'd all died. And I think he managed about 280. Um, and I was saying this to him. I said, oh, you know, we've got to get it done. He said, no, 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 you're wrong. He said, in the 1980s, I was a student at Durham. He said, and uh, I can remember going to the, the open air museum at Beamish in the 80s. He said, and there wasn't that much there in the 80s, but what was there was great. And every time I've been back, there's been a bit more of it and it's got better. He said, but more important than any of that, I've been on the journey with them and I've seen it get better. And that's what you need to do. So what we think we'll probably do, we'll probably get one more hut up and which we've already started sort of um, sorting out the, 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 the building for. Um, and once we've got that hut up and start to put some of the artifacts and exhibits in, at that point, I think it's, you know, it's fair to charge people to come in. At the moment, uh, every event is, is free because we kind of think, well, you know, we're, th there's not really that much to see. But once there's, there's really stuff that's worth seeing, then I think that's, uh, it's fair to ask people to pay. Um, and people also say, well, why haven't we heard of this before? Why haven't you been shouting about this for years? And I said, well, if we said to you that we'd got an empty site and a great idea, you wouldn't have believed us. You know, we needed to get to this stage where we go, look, this is an army camp. I mean, actually, I nowadays, I, I come to work in the mornings and I go, yeah, that's an army camp. Whereas, you know, up until a, a year and a half ago, you sort of think, well, that's an interesting collection of old wooden buildings, but it's not an army mm -hmm. camp. But now it is, it really is. Yeah, that's great. I think the idea that it will never be completed is quite, quite a yeah. good one, really. And that <laughs> it keeps it dynamic and interesting and keeps yeah. people, think, give people something to, to, to follow and to be yeah. interested in. And, you know, there's always more to know. I think that's always the case about any museum or any heritage organisation. Um, so another question for you is, in general, how well have these huts fared for the 100 plus years of use? I mean, the answer to that is, is simply if they've been looked after, they're in pretty good order. I mean, that um, the, the Stowe Market Girl Guide site that we've literally just put up was in remarkably good condition because generations of Girl Guide dads had soaked it with creosote and yeah. it had preserved it. Um, whereas, as I say, the, the biggest killer of them is the fact that people allow muck and mulch to build up against the bottom edges. Um, they'll have the car park resurfaced and, and, and it will butt right up against the bottom edge of the hut so it can't breathe. And then, of course, they, they rot from the bottom up. And if they rot from the bottom, the only way to cure that is to take the whole thing down and, and repair it and put it back up again, which most people don't do. Um, but I mean, I mean, the Girton hut, the corrugated tin hut, um, Kev's put hardly any new pieces of timber in that. I mean, the, the big what we call the wall plate, which is the, the, the single piece of timber it sits on, which was four and a half by four inches square all the way round, which we had to have made. That had rotted away almost completely. But what that had done had saved the rest of it. But it, it was in remarkably good order, for, considering it was would definitely built in, in, in September, October 1914. So I think, uh, as I say, if they've been looked after um, and if people have kept the roofs in good order and if people have made sure that, you know, it, they've kept it painted or they've, they've made sure if it was leaking, they've cured the leak. They're in good condition. Just to be honest, be the same thing. If you don't look after your house, it will fall apart. <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, certainly like some of the ones in East Riggs and Gretna have stood up quite well from the yeah. 100 plus years, um, but lots of the others have, have been demolished. So I imagine it just depends on how well they've been used. 
I, I think uh, the, the, the other the other problem is that a lot of villagers that have very very good huts still they just say oh it's time we had a new one and so very often a lot of very good buildings even now are still pulled down and destroyed because oh well we're going to have something new and um and sometimes you're lucky enough to to know that or hear about that and even if it's one that we can't save we've been able to put other people onto them and save them uh, but an awful lot of them just just end up being bulldozed even if they're in good order so yeah, yeah just that's uh, something we at the Devil's Porridge Museum have been concerned about for a while. There's lots of bits and bobs left of Patron Factory Gretna, but it's in this person's field, that person's yeah. field. Uh, and you will just worry one day that person will just think, ah, yeah. just knock it down. Yeah. Uh, so I think someone has asked a question. I think Helen's oh, asked sorry, a question. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any protection such as listing for any huts that have survived or can they just be knocked down? Yeah, I mean, my, my partner Lindsay's. Um, I mean, uh, part of her role is 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 in listed buildings, and um, and she says that that because they're temporary, um, then th there are none that are listed. Um, and the other problem is that very often, um, because none of them or hardly any of them are on their original sites. Part of the argument is, well, it didn't start life there; it's it's somewhere else. But of course, uh, and we've had people say to us, "Oh, well, we, we, you know." Um, we, we've got a, a couple of nice ones that came from Colchester and so Essex had got a, a, a an Essex heritage building fund and so well you know are we eligible for this because these are Essex buildings and uh, well no because you've moved them into Suffolk um, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> so so um, which is frustrating because they're still Essex buildings and and we will tell the history as Essex buildings but that's a that, that's a problem as well they're sort of you know clearly defined oh the minute it steps over the border it's no longer anything to do with us um yeah but but um but well, yeah there's all sorts of issues as i'm sure you're aware it's like it's a it's a double-edged sword isn't it having listing and protecting status yeah. it can just it make is. it possible to do things yeah. as well yeah. um and yeah i mean I, 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 I think that's uh that's the other thing it's it, it's certainly in our best interest that they're not listed because normally nearly everyone you get will have been adapted in some form over its lifetime. So uh, with Girton, uh, after the war, when, when you bought your hut, um, in its original form, it would have been 60 foot long, 20 foot wide, but they bought additional bits because they wanted a longer hut. So they bought enough to make an 80 foot hut using bits and pieces. And obviously we've now turned it back into its original 60 foot form. And we've put all the doors back where they would have been. And we've put the windows back where they would have been. But obviously if it was listed, then it would have been listed in its, you know, in its Girton Women's Institute form rather than in the form that it would have been when the, uh, when the army put it up in 1914. So, mm. so from our point of view, it's um, actually, it's probably better that, <laughs> that we have the freedom to restore them. Yeah, and then you get into that it was for four years like this, and for then yeah. like 80 odd years it was like this, but we yeah. want it back like for four years, which is the bit we're interested in. And it That's it. All, yeah, issues. Um, so Morag has put a, a comment here about um, she's worked on Glasgow City Council's World War One website, um, which is based on a lot of biographies. By the end of the war, by the end of it, I was war and trenched out as there were many <laughs> similar projects. Is there going to be a build up of interest again? This is actually something I had a recent conversation with the National Memorial Arboretum. They yeah. were quite interested in doing an exhibition at the Devil's Porridge Museum, but when they took it to their trustees, they felt they were World War One outed. They'd had enough of World War One. Well, they I mean, the, back in a few years was the answer. Do yeah, you think I mean, there's going to be a more interest as the centenary anniversaries? Do you think it peaked interest? Do you think it will come back? Uh, what do you think? I mean, because because our background has been in sort of film and television work we've been around long enough to go through uh, you know the, the 80th anniversary the 85th the 90th the 95th the centenary and we know that the television people go right we've done the first world war we're never going to do that again and within two years they go well actually people are asking for first world war programs so back it comes again and we start hiring them uniforms so we know that these things are always cyclic it will always come back what we also know because We'd been right across the whole thing, really, because we were hiring uniforms and equipment and uh, to theatres and amateur theatres and, and local projects and goodness knows what else. I think that it's pretty true that that the interest that existed before the centenary is exactly the same as it was. And what happened during the centenary, there were spikes of people uh, doing some fantastic local history work, uh, which has been brilliant. So local stories have been recorded. But what there hasn't been is a drop in it. So, yes, all right, the, the, the spikes have just returned back to the level it was before. Um, 
certainly we've seen a lot of historians who've jumped ship who are going, well, I've done the First World War, I'm moving on to the second now because I don't think anyone's going to buy any more books. But actually, we've not seen any, any drop in that. Um, and also what we're targeting, we are specifically targeting people with no interest in the First World War. You know, we're, we, we really want to tell people stuff that, that, that they don't know. So, I mean, I, back in 2010, I set myself a target of, of going to do talks about the First World War a specific talk, a talk called Remembrance and the Great War, a very British view, which really wasn't about remembrance at all. It was more about the way that the British remember the First World War or misremember it in a way. Um, and I, I deliberately targeted groups of over 100 people who had no real interest in the First War. So University of the Third Age, women's institutes, family history groups, all of that kind of stuff. And it was fascinating because and it wasn't a case of me saying what I think is right and what you think is wrong. It was a case of, have you ever thought about it like this? And just give them all the bits and pieces to work it out for themselves. And at the end of every single one of those talks, even now I still do it occasionally, you very rarely get people coming back going, well, that's all nonsense. All you can hear on their way out is, well, that's really interesting. I never knew. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I've never thought about it like that. And that's what we want to replicate here. We want people to get that idea and to, to take on board that, that what we're looking at here isn't just uh, it's all about mud and blood and barbed wire. This is this is a fantastic, amazing national story of achievement of of taking a tiny, tiny army and turning it up into this massive war winning machine. But at every level, so that the postal service, you know, that the postal service could could take a letter from from somebody at Gretna and get it into a soldier in the front line three days later. You know, that the post office couldn't do that now. And it's all of those interesting bits and pieces that that people can relate to. People don't get, you know, nobody, there's nobody listening to this tonight, with the possible exception of Nick Short, who understands the concept of bayoneting German soldiers. It's not what we do. But all of the other stuff, how you live, how you eat, writing letters, going to the toilet, fixing clothes, supply, transport, logistics, all of that stuff, which is fascinating, very rarely ever covered, all of that we're going to build into this because those are the stories that that we found people are interested in and we're very keen to things like uh, very often I mean, we, we, we went to a museum over the weekend Lindsay and I and there was a sort of a this is women at war well we don't want to do women at war as a as a as a right, women at war was this bit we want to drop the, the the women in to the places where they were really making a difference so when we talk about munitions there'll be the munition workers when we in 1915 when we talk about the raising of the land army there's the land army girls doing what they do so as you weave your way through the museum you come across them just doing what they did come 1918 you know that the, 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 the women's army auxiliary corps have taken over huge amounts of work from drivers from clerks from cooks releasing men to go and fight in the front line when when the manpower was you know, when they were struggling for manpower so all of these places where they really made a difference rather than just go well we're going to put them all in a box and and, and it's just that story and that's the intention all the way through that we're going to be looking for ways of just just doing it a bit differently really yeah I remember when I started working at the Devil's Porridge Museum, one of the things that I found quite surprising was I'd got the sort of Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen uh, view of the First World War and actually realising that as much as some people felt like that, obviously there was a lot of much complex, much more complex feelings about it and there was a great deal of investment in it. And people uh, take, you know, I think people who visit the Devil's Porridge Museum they want to hear the lions led by donkeys sort of storyline sometimes that everyone was a heartless boss and no one cared but actually it was quite a lot more complex than that yeah. um which i'm sure that your uh, account will also show um so just looking at what bridget said she, i was a nurse in the army in the late 1970s early 80s in old shop our nursing home was a spider approximately six smaller wooden huts with adjoining corridors we all had our own room have you come across any of them um we've not come across any surviving spiders in, in a lot of places we've got the documentation for them i mean again i mean my passion for the suffolk regiment museum we know that that hogs because we've got hogs paperwork built wooden huts on uh, what had been part of the uh, the sports ground at gibraltar barracks and by the 1950s they'd, they'd been reconfigured into spider blocks where they all joined together so you could go from one to another without getting wet in the rain but again in the 1960s or 70s all of that lot was cleared um, and you tend to find that it's it's very rare 
to find anywhere. I, I don't think we've come across anywhere where the spider huts have survived. Um, somebody might well tell me there's still an army camp somewhere that have got them because some camps still have them. They're just hanging on. But but even then, most army camps have had the windows replaced. The doors have been replaced. They've all been messed around. So there's very little that survives. But I, I can't think that there's any left still in that spider form with the connecting corridors or none that we've come across. Well, here's the question that I can answer. Hillary has asked, were there any examples of buildings with upper stories? Well, yes, there were, and there were several examples at HM Factory Gretna in East Driggs and Gretna, where the Devil's Porridge Museum is based. Um, I think at Gretna, there were five different types of hostels. I'm not sure if any of them were Armstrong huts. I'd be have to compare the plans with the yeah. Armstrong plans. That'd be interesting. Are you aware of many other with upper stories, uh, Taff? No, I mean, um apart from the ones at Gretna, I, I don't think we've ever come across any other double-decker huts at all. Um, and again, the, the fascinating thing with it, it's, it's the same with the, with the layout. Um, you can see very often with the layout of these big army camps, they start off in their neat rows, and then they, then suddenly the, 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 they, they bump into a problem with the ground, and suddenly they're all higgledy-piggledy, and then it gets neat again. And it would have been the same thing, right, we've got this amount of space, we, we, you know, we've acquired this amount of space, we need to put this amount of people in, actually the solution, will make some of them two story. I mean, it's a, it's a very sensible thing to do. And, um, but like I say, I don't think we've come across them anywhere other than Gretna. I'm sure that they were. I'm sure, sure they would have been a, a standard, they would have had to have been an approved design, I'm sure. But, uh, but no, we've not come across any. Oh, uh, great. So uh, someone said there might be an issue with the date on your last slide. Um, you might just look at that tab. No, uh, probably. Someone else has said <laughs> <laughs> that I have to sign off early, but I want to say thanks for having oh. this event. Very interesting, <laughs> all the way from Illinois. So that's really nice to hear. Very good. Uh, someone's asked, can you become a friend of the Great War Huts project? Is that a that's, good way yeah. to raise funds? That's a good question. Um, we haven't yet sorted that out. We should do. Yeah, we, we really should do. Um, I mean, we've got some fantastic supporters who time and time again um, do come to our events, who, who, who keep in touch with us. I mean, we've got a, a very, very popular Facebook page. We've, we've got a website. We've got a very active Twitter account and an Instagram account, which, which gain a lot of traction because we post, obviously, every time we're restoring buildings, it goes on there. Uh, we post interesting stuff about the uh, about artifacts that we've got in the collection. Um, and, and then there's, I mean, the site itself, because it's stuff full of interesting animals. There's Hut Watch, where we have, uh, I mean, this morning, Barry's turned up with, and he's captured some footage of badgers and deer and all sorts of stuff just overnight last night. So so every now and again, we post that too. I mean, it's, uh, so, so there's sort of something for everyone, really. But but we, we, we must do that. We must do a, a friends thing so that... Uh, because I know how keen that there are a lot of people who are very keen to, to, to show their support, which would be great. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so uh, someone called Bobby said, so interesting as usual, thank you. I spent uh, several TA camps in huts. So that's someone called Bobby, you might know <laughs> yes, I do. Um, yeah. So someone's asked, I'm interested in the huts used to house munitions workers. Have you come across any info regarding the internal layout of such huts? Um, we think we have uh, contents lists at the Devil's Forage Museum, so we know what was in each of the huts, and later on when they built the stone hostels, the brick hostels, uh, we know about the contents, but we I don't think there's any plans as in this is the set layout, but you've got an idea of how many beds and how many things were inside of them. I believe the ones I've read about all had a central stove or something. They, yeah. had, they had heating inside them, definitely. Yeah. Um, but if you want to email me, um, I can send you more information about that, whoever it was who asked that question. You've got my email because I sent you the Eventbrite, um, the Zoom link. Uh, so feel free to email me if you've got any questions. So what is the most unusual uses that the huts have been put to in your experience? <laughs> unusual. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, like I say, uh, during their army service, I mean, they, they were used for all sorts. The, uh, the, they, they were adapted, they were altered, they were turned into theatres, they, um, they, they were turned into garages, they were turned into rifle ranges, um, they uh, obviously the hospital wards. Uh, and there's a great deal of adaption as well. Ones that start, well, like G Cherry Hinton had started as, a, as an army camp and then became a hospital. So there was a lot of adaption there. I mean, the, the Girton Hut had got internal swinging walls that they'd put in. Um, obviously the majority of them after the war become homes, they become scout huts, they become WI huts. Um, uh, what else have we found them doing? That's a good question. Um, community centers, I'm trying to think whether we'd got, whether we'd actually 
uh, a lot of them were churches, a lot of them became churches and chapels. Um, I can't think of anything that we've come across of the ones that we've looked at or we've taken down that were really, that had a really wacky use. Um, no, I mean, well, someone's got a comment here saying, I remember one of the huts in East Riggs was used as a barber's into the 1980s. We had to jump over a hole in the entrance to get <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean they, they were cheap. They were such a, a cheap way of, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, but it, I mean, I mean, presumably if you, you, you know the five different styles that you had, so maybe the, the surviving ones, you know, because I mean, the big problem is people always say, oh, well, that one must have come from Clipstone Camp because it's 20 mm -hmm. miles away from Clipstone. Well, it might have done. But the thing to remember at the time, there were hundreds and hundreds of little camps as well as the big divisional camps. So there were little tiny uh, motor transport pools, which might have had five or six lorries or petrol wagons or, or, or water bowsers, um, literally in a, in a small compound on the outskirts of a village somewhere that serviced five or six different camps. All of these places might have had anything from one to, to five or six or 10 huts. So unless there's a direct link, unless there's a specific um, paper trail that says and very often that turns up in newspapers it's just a laborious thing to do sometimes you can find ah such and such village have have just completed the village hall and the mayor's just opened it and it was bought from so and so and carried down from such and such camp so some of ours we've managed to identify but others you know it's um and, and really we you know we, we we take on board the local legend but we don't believe it until we've proved it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of local legends of this ended up here and that ended up there, and there may be some veracity in them, but you ha you do have to check check it out, don't you, and try to try to verify it. I think we're in the middle of a project to uh, track down the people of the Patreon factory, Gretna. Yeah. Uh, maybe the next project will be tracking down the the remaining stuff of HM yeah. factory, Gretna, because yeah. it does get scattered quite widely. Um, so we've got a comment from Melanie who says we've got Hut 9 project World War II in South Wales. The yeah. hut were built, huts were built for munitions workers and it ended as a POW camp. Yeah, yeah. Worked on it and it's done and it is fantastic. Um, I mean, I think that there's, there's a good point to be made about Hut 9 because very often there are there are a number of completes, especially Second War camps that have survived, some of them in better condition than others. And very often people say, oh, we must save the whole camp. And very often by trying to save all of it you end up saving none of it because you know if you work sometimes you work with a property developer and say look we really want to say this it's important local history very often it's in their best interest to save a bit of it enough car parking and a hut or a hut or two whereas if you fight to try and keep all of it very often you'll end up and the whole lot goes and i think that hut nine is a great example of saying well th there would have been tons of these this is the last survivor or one of the last survivors but but they've got that and they've managed to save that and 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 that the, the, the chances of that remaining for you know long into the future have vastly increased because nobody tried to say well there's there's still 50 huts here we need to save all of them mm. yeah i think uh, i can see a few people here from the on war service living history group and uh, i think like what you're doing is like is very much like a living history experiential archaeology project yeah uh, which I think that's the really interesting way to go with 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 this period, because uh, people think that's like experiential archaeology is more for like the Stone Age or something. But actually yeah. to do it and and to show what it really was like, it's fascinating. And to, to and, really and I mean I I mean Kevin and I both belong to a, a bunch called the Khaki Chums, who were the Association for Military Remembrance. I mean the Chums weren't really a a reenactment group. The Chums was. Uh, was really a study group for us so we would go to France, Belgium, Holland or whatever and we would live the part for a week, 10 days or sometimes a lot longer wearing nothing but what the fellas had at the time from everything really from the Boer War to the, to the end of national service as a learning experience to understand it uh, and we met a lot of veterans, uh, certainly First War, Second War veterans, national servicemen um, and so when we came to do the film and television work uh, one of the reasons why we got so much work was because um, as an advisor a director could say to me, well, what would the fellows have done in this instance? And I'll know because we, we, we kind of done that for real, where we understood the kit. And I think that that's one of, I, I, I still think it's a really, really important part of the learning process. Because okay. if you wear the stuff, you, you end up, you have an understanding of it. Uh, and we've slept in barricades, you know, we've slept outside of the road. We, we've done all of these things that, that all add to that experience, um, which have really helped throughout this yeah. project. Uh, let, let alone the fact that we we understand and recognize the stuff that we're finding or or you find a drawing on the wall and go well that's a that, that's a drummer because you can see the little badge on his sleeve and things like that 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard it so many times from historians over the years. Like, we didn't know why this, and then we tried it ourselves, and we're like, oh, that's why. That's why that's there. That's why you yeah. put that there. It makes sense. The people who did it at the time generally made sense. Yeah. Um, so Hillary said the expression scout hook probably comes about because so many newly created scout groups after the war got ex-army hooked. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. probably true. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very and, true. And uh, Morag had a typing error. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, the underwear exhibition could also include things about menstruation. Nurses made the sanitary towels from dressings and from the spikes. Yeah. I can never remember her to say Sphagnum moss, which was yeah. gathered and dried by yeah. school girls, at least around Glasgow, and was processed at the School of Art. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Used for wound dressings yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. Liz says, oh, hello, Liz. I think the Canadian hospital at La Treport might have been a spider block cartwheel design hospital. Also, nurses, VADs used to have a cape called a corridor cape for walking between the huts under the covered walkways. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, Melanie says, fantastic talk, can't wait to visit. Thank you. That's nice, Fair. Thank you very much, Melanie, for your kind words. Um, and Andrew from Stobbs Camp. Oh, hello, Stobbs oh, Camp. Yeah. Uh, we have a remaining World War One hut at Stobbs Camp, POW Camp in the Scottish Borders. Do you think the use of huts in internment camps are under researched? Um I mean, it, it's I mean, I think part of the problem with all of this is that there, there are a lot of people doing their own little bits of research. Um, and some people are very protective over it and don't share stuff. Whereas we've, whatever we've got, we'll share it. If we found some information, if you ring us up tomorrow or you email, if we've got the answer, we'll always share it and we'll tell you. But it's been very frustrating with some places where you sort of, you, sometimes you get three different approaches for the same site. And you say, well, we've told you this. Oh, no, no, you told the other lot. Well, oh, come on, you know, if you work together, it's just Internal so much- Internal politics. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, because the, the, I mean, the, the, there's been a, a good book re written recently about uh, interned German prisoners. But again, it's such a vast subject that that people tend to sort of concentrate on one camp or another rather than look at the whole lot. And again, it's there, there is no such thing as this was the experience. This is how it was done. This is how it was used. Um, mm in the same way that even something as simple as well the interior of a barricade it might be 20 foot wide and it might be 60 foot long but when you look at it some of the some of the six foot tables have got wooden trestles some have got folding legs some have got metal victorian cast iron legs. and th th so it's impossible to say this this is the definitive because you have to be specific i mean this is a war you know which involved millions and millions of people both servicemen and women as well as civilians and everybody's doing their bit to make it work and some things they try it doesn't work they bin it off but it might well be that the photographs you've got the surviving photographs of this disastrous thing that didn't work so here we are trying to build it like this and then you build it and then it breaks or whatever and then you'll find the evidence that says actually that didn't work so i think with all of this stuff it's um some of the information is still out there some of it, if you rummage around long enough, you'll find some of it's long gone. It's like this enormous jigsaw puzzle. Um, most of the pieces are missing, but every now and again, you can put two or three of the bits together and see a bit more of the bigger picture. And I think that's really, that's the magic of it. Um, none of us ever really get to scratch more than the surface of this stuff. But when you do, and, and you can meet with other people who, who are, who've got their own bits of the jigsaw and you can all help put things together. Um, you know, I, th I think that's, that's, that's the best that we'll ever do, but... Um, but it's certainly worth doing. I, I mean, I uh, appreciate what Andrew's saying there about the uh, POWs, uh, certainly at the Devil's Porridge Museum, we've got quite a lot of accounts of POWs in the local area. And there's a Ukrainian chapel um, at Lockerbie from World War yep. II. Um, and uh, we're currently working on a project. We're involved as a partner with the Imperial War Museum, the Second World War and Holocaust Partnership Program, yep. which is a wonderful mouthful, shortened to IWSWWHPP, um, which is even more catchy. <laughs> I guess I prefer uh, the name. So we have, we're, we're currently involved in that. And the idea of that is to share sort of like hidden histories from second, the Second World War. So yep. we're, I'm very keen uh, as our part of it is to share some of the POW stories from the local yep. area because there was a surprising amount of them, and uh, it's not something that's that widely known, I don't think. Yeah. I, think it's I mean, the, um, 
the, the, the guys at Nokolo Camp or the site of Nokolo Camp in the Isle of Man, uh, we've been um, trying to help them rescue a hut from Scotland to take back and, and restore as because uh, they think that the one up in Scotland um, was taken from Nokolo in the first place and shipped over to Scotland. Um, so, um, so and, and they've got a lot of research on civilian internees who, who are interned on the Isle of Man. So again, another strand of research and uh, and they all the time they get you know, people turning up saying, oh, my uncle Fritz and his wife were, were, were interned here during the war. What have you got? And very often they'll have got the, the names will crop up on 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 lists of internees. And uh, so, yeah, I think uh, I mean, as with all this stuff, you could spend the rest of your lives researching it and <laughs> still never yeah, scratch the surface. Uh, you'll never get bored. That's good. No, no, that's true. Uh, so uh, Morik has a very valid comment, which I completely agree with. The lack of sharing of information is such a pity. Uh, many Scottish local authorities and societies didn't want to share, didn't know what each other was doing, and not all the research and websites have been saved. That's certainly been a big issue with a lot yeah. of the World War One centenary yeah. issues yeah. that they were put. They didn't have any legacy, which was something Taff yeah. and I were discussing earlier as well about the importance of that. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of mindsets in organisations that just needs to change that, you know, that information is for sharing, not for yeah. guarding, um, yeah. you know, but I, I understand the professional need to, you know, think about your own funding and your own stability, but ultimately, uh, if you work in a museum or heritage organisation or any kind of organisation like that, you want people to know about it, surely, yeah. so sharing, yeah. It's, yeah. you've just got to embrace the mindset and and, and, I, and I think that, and I think that that, that that it then pays you back because people are much more inclined to help you out and bring other stuff to you. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that. Yeah, I think that. That's. I mean, I, I see Kelvin. That Kelvin Dakin there. I mean, Kelvin's done some fantastic work on uh, on Bramford War Memorial just outside Ipswich, and all of the time sharing the stories and uh, and anything that I've got of the men that he's talking about. You know, we we swap and exchange information, and all of the time it's just helping. It's spreading. It's adding to it, and then somebody else yeah. chips in, and somebody else, and it just you know, yeah, it, it just makes absolutely. such a difference. Absolutely. Here, here. Um, so uh, Valerie says thank you very much that was very interesting we'll definitely visit once you're open I'm sure that we could we all we all feel that that's a brilliant place to visit soon um, so how long, do, how long would it have taken in the Great War to put a camp up and how many men per hut to put it up is a question from all of oh, that that's a great question. I mean, to begin with, the, the big Armstrong huts took a team of about 25 men uh, that it would take them a couple of days to put each hut up. Uh, and so there was a, a huge number of them. Um, some of them were put up by soldiers themselves, the Royal Engineers. Obviously, they, they had the skills to do it. There was an awful lot of civilians who were joiners, who were carpenters, uh, who had those skills as well. So a lot of that could be pressed into service. Um, companies like Harrods, I mean, Harrods paid for entire camp to be shipped across to France and assembled. Uh, and they sent across the team of workers to put it all together. Um, so... But, but as the war progresses, or even quite quickly, actually, they go from that very fixed, rigid, Armstrong designs, rigid frame, which is then clad, to the huts like the ones on Cannock Chase, which were in their 10 foot sections so that they could be made, brought to the site and assembled. But they still needed a lot of men because they're very heavy. Uh, then as the war progresses, they get to six foot panels like our big recreation hut, where literally a team of five men could put that whole hut up or, or in, in its single original form. Uh, you could probably put that up in a couple of days just with five men. So all of the time you're reducing materials, because uh, again, the, the early Armstrong huts have these huge trusses, you know, sort of four inches square trusses to hold the roof up. By the time you get to those late 1917-18 ones, they're just like flimsy little sort of triangles of timber with a brace across, because at some point the man from the ministry has turned up and said, right, what's, what's the minimum amount of wood you need to hold the roof up? Right, make them like that. And you see this process all the way through the war, finding ways to make them cheaper and simpler. Um, and that process has continued 25 years later because we've got one hut, which was a second war hut, which was made in five foot sections, so even smaller, clad on both sides already. So you didn't need to put it up and then line the inside. Um, but the interesting thing, the framing, whereas a first world war hut, you'd need a joiner to make the joints for the corners. The second war hut, was made just nailing bits of timber together. So you'd got a, a tube or one length of timber. And if you wanted a joint, you'd just overlap the end. And then coming the other way, you'd overlap it the other way and just nail them together. So you needed no skilled labor at all. So any, literally anybody who'd got the manpower could, could, could make the huts. So even then, 25 years later, they're still learning lessons that hadn't been learned first time around and improving the breed, 
simplifying it. Uh, they made what they called the standard hut, which in theory, um, people making it to the same plan all over the country, you could take the, a panel from a company in Scotland and another from someone in Cornwall and a, a roof panel from somewhere in Wales, bolt them all together and it would fit. Um, mm. So all the way through that, that, that sort of learning process never stopped. Yeah, always looking for ways to economize and improve efficiency yeah. and yeah, yeah. absolutely um so uh, andrew's written a couple of nice comments for you well one nice comment and one question so you've always been very helpful to us on twitter which i can also very much for always supportive and so knowledgeable and could you recommend a good book on first world war hits or have you not written it so first world war books <laughs> or have you not written it yet yeah, we, we've not written it yet. I mean, there are some good. I mean, most of them are about the camp. So uh, things like, um, oh, what's his name? White House's book, um, a, a Camp for Four Seasons about Cannock Chase. Um, there are specific books about the London Gunners at, at Gaybridge Park. Um, th th so there are a lot of uh, there's another one about Kinmel Park up in Wales, where, where the uh, where the Canadians rioted at the end of the war. So there's a lot of information. You can get lots of little bits and pieces of information, but there is there's no sort of definitive. It was like this. Um, mm. There's some useful official stuff. The Royal Engineers Journal at the end of the war, I think 1919. Um, Grierson, who um, who had been the um, D director of uh, of the Royal Engineers at the outbreak of war uh, did quite a useful, although not completely accurate, piece about the the, the scale of the problem. You know that how many huts they had to build in a short space of time. So there's a lot of this stuff that that you can sort of gather together. Um, but there's a lot more research to be done once we've finally finished building army huts um, to to sort of try and draw anything like a a proper full picture of it. Um, and I suspect probably it's it. it it was on such a scale that that's probably beyond all of us really it, it, and probably would have been even in 1921 22. Uh, yeah there's um it's, it's really interesting that you keep mentioning the royal engineers because there are quite a few royal engineers at hm factory gretna uh, and i've always wondered what they were involved in i know one was uh, some of them were involved in the chemistry but the possibility that they were actually just involved in the construction of the huts might yeah. you know it's quite yeah. an interesting one yeah, um, yeah. So, um, Morag said you need to build a timber frame Roman hut and then you could do a time and motion study of comparison building a Roman hut <laughs> and yeah. World War One huts. Certainly at, at Gretna, they, there's an account of uh, the building hostels and a girl going to work for a shift and the hostel was just, you know, foundations. And when she came yeah. back eight hours later, they'd built a whole yeah. brick yeah. hostel. So by, yeah. the, by the end of the war, I think they were throwing things up, uh, you know, once they got the hang of it. I mean, in, in, in the big German March offensive in 1918, in March 1918, the, um, the Germans came crashing through so quickly that there was over 100 huts were lost in, in enemy action. But a lot more of them were saved because literally teams of volunteers who were off duty were dismantling these massive YMCA, Church Army, Salvation huts, moving them back 20 or 30 miles and putting them back up again. And some of them were moved three and four times. So, you know, that, that, and, and that just mob handed, l l ridiculously large amounts of manpower, all just mucking in, shift it, put it back up again. Um, and then, um, th then local, sort of local, uh, the, the Oxford Hut Day was one of them where they were raising money to, uh, to pay to replace the, 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 the written off recreation huts. Because uh, they, they, were, they weren't paid for by the army at all. They were all by public subscription. The, the, the Boy Scouts paid, I mean, um, Baden Powell himself um, launched appeals to build huts. Um, as I say, Church Army, Scottish Church Army huts, the um, uh, the uh, Salvation Army, the Catholic Women's Huts, or whatever. I mean, there's so many yeah, different. Yeah, I think there were later on like widows' huts as well, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I think there yeah, were what, like yeah. widows, widows, uh, and orphans' huts or something yeah. like that. Too, wasn't there? And, and, and um, of course, the, the other thing to remember is that right at the end of the war in France. Uh, there was a, a version of hut which were built for for the refugees when they came back to their destroyed villages and some of those still exist i mean it'd be quite nice to get one of those but they're, they're, the ones that have survived are quite popular now the, the french and the belgians like to hang on to them but but mm. dotted around all over the the somme and uh, down to cambrai and places like that and some up still in the middle of Ypres, uh, are these literally these temporary wooden huts which again like ours have, have survived over 100 years and are still doing you know still doing the job they were built for Brilliant, yeah. Uh, so Bob says there are two nice little local history books on Chiseldon Camp, the VD Hospital. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we've not got that. I need to. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to yeah, dro drop us a message and just uh, tell us all about that, I'd be. Uh, we'd, we'd like to gather those for the archive because we, we, we're building up a sort of archive of all the known published uh, 
um, works if we can, because they, they they all add something. Every single one of them tells a slightly different story. They really do. Yeah, so we've got lots of documents about at the end of the war where they reflected on what they'd done in the war at HM Factory Gretna and wrote about it. Quite a lot of it self congratulatory, but also <laughs> yeah. in a sort of here's how to in case there's another war yes. again. Yeah. Is there something comparable for huts? I mean, did 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 arm was there a person called Armstrong who designed the hut? Did he? Write yeah, I mean, or, Major Armstrong. I, I think that Major Major Armstrong really had just done his thing, been employed to do it, and then went off and did other stuff. And I I've not found a single thing that he'd ever commented later about about yeah. you know, um, but certainly. Um, Grierson and others that they do write about uh, they do write about it but again uh, and in, in the um, in the history of the Royal Engineers they talk about the different types of hut because again in France there were all sorts of temporary huts some made of felt um, there were wooden ones there were metal ones there, there were asbestos ones um, obviously Nissen huts which everybody's familiar with uh, turn up in 1916 and the great thing with the Nissen hut is that the whole thing will fit on a on an army lorry um, and, and because all the sheets of tin sit one on top of the other, they take up literally no space. So that, that was a major step forward, although um, obviously it, it has a limitation in, in the fact that it's got that sort of domed roof. Um, so you lose most of the sides of the building. So it wasn't that they weren't much good for, for nursing wards or or storage sheds or anything like that. But um, but yeah, there's um, there's a lot of simple information about that. But obviously yeah. it tends to be written um for people to read who who know what they're reading so yeah. the history of the royal engineers is is really written for people who've been in the royal engineers rather than written for people a century later who don't know anything about it <laughs> yeah the architects of h and factory gretna who designed the housing later on they also wrote for the architect's journal and things like that oh, yeah, so there's quite yeah. a few publications about that but yeah. i don't remember seeing anything about the huts anywhere about in the same sense other yeah. than a very matter of fact they cost this this what this type costs this much yeah, yeah. need this much wood yeah uh, very much the basics yeah i mean there's uh, um, there's even stuff in hansard um there was a, quite a thing about mcalpines uh, yeah. a big sort of scandal where they were claiming that mcalpine was was charging too much for his huts and uh eventually exonerated and, and proved that actually he wasn't ripping people off after all but um mm -hmm. but but you find these little bits of detail in all sorts of weird and wonderful places um but it's uh, it's that just extracting it and trying to gather it all and uh, and eventually make sense of it. Well, uh, I think it seems like the questions have run out, but they're, they're coming <laughs> thick and fast there for you. Oh, hang on one more. Oh, thank you, Maura. I got a great, uh, nice comment. Talk's been great. Thank you. Uh, as for VD hospitals, we found people suffering from it on their online army records, but the doctors yeah. didn't realise its effect on the heart. People who had it were still dying of heart disease due to VD after the war. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. In, in yeah. fact, one, one of the fellows that, uh, that we've got all of his paperwork, whose story will tell, he was still receiving injections of mercury into his backside as late as 1964 in the Royal Hospital at Chelsea as a, as a result of it. So, so yeah, the, the, the far ranging, far reaching. In fact, though, his daughter asked me for a copy of his service record and I kind of weeded that bit out and because uh, I thought she could be spared that and sent it to her and a, a week later she ran it and said oh this is marvellous absolutely marvellous I'm really tough this I'm just really surprised it doesn't mention the fact he had the clap and <laughs> oh, all right, then I'll, I'll send you the last bit as well then so. yeah. <laughs> but yeah there's some yeah. yeah amongst the personal stories again sometimes in letters we've found great bits and pieces about huts and uh, and details as well so mm. yeah yeah, that's absolutely, uh, well, it's been a fascinating evening to have, and I'm sure that we all just want to say thank you so much for that's your time, pleasure. enthusiasm, ideas, knowledge, etc. Uh, and what a wonderful project this is, and I'm, I'm sure, speaking on behalf of the museum, we're going to watch your progress with great interest and look forward to visiting you soon. Uh, and likewise, and, uh, we should be sure coming up. Yeah, Lots we'll be coming up to see you too. <laughs> Absolutely great. Um, well, this uh, recording, if you if you missed any of it, or if you know anyone who'd like to see it, it should be on our YouTube channel within the next few days. But on behalf of everyone here, there's lots of lovely comments coming in. Uh, I'm just going to give you a round of applause and say thank you thank so you. much Cheers. for you know, spending your time with us this evening. And it's been lovely to see everyone. Hope to see you again at our next uh, online talk and at the museum someday soon. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. Have a lovely evening. Wonderful to see you. I'm going to end it now for everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Taff. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.